From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Got a confession for you, Matt. All right. I did my quarterly dive into our podcast reviews. About every three months I do that. I noticed your Twitter uh, (laughs) request for reviews. Oh, yeah? (laughs) And following me on Twitter? Yeah. Yeah. Um, No, I just saw it through the conspiracy stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to thank everybody who took the time to make a... write a review whether yeah. whether good or bad or simply middling we really do appreciate it and shout out to our longtime listeners many of whom i recognize just based on the way you talk in the review uh, especially uh there there were a couple great ones where someone said hey i hope this gets you guys one step further away from being fired and i nice. thought wow this you have been listening a long time. Uh, people had great stuff to say about you, Matt, and uh, about Noel, and, and about you as well, Paul, Mission Control Deccan. So thanks to everybody, uh, sincerely, who checked in and and gave us a rating. Even the people who, uh, for one reason or another, gave us one star because our uh, the facts that we presented about a specific issue did not jibe with their opinions. Got you. Thank you for taking the time. It just feels like two dudes at a bar kicking <laughs> it. One star. That, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Did you pull them up? Are you reading one? Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, without spending too much time on it, it's uh, we're very fortunate for every listener, and we're grateful for your time. I have to ask, and this is something that you and I have talked about, I think, a little bit before off air. I have to ask, Matt, are you in your personal life a fan of maps, cartography, stuff like that? Yeah. I mean, my wall is just covered with maps of video game uh, worlds. Really? Yeah. But, uh, but you know, in the real world, it's for some reason not as appealing to me, though I do love knowing, let's say, within the world of Skyrim, like where particular towns are with relation to the giant mountain. This is so ridiculous. I have been playing, I'm at the level of Skyrim on my replay uh, where I am just trying to find every location. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, you have to do that. Have you found every location? Yeah. I don't know if I have every so often. Like the numbers don't jive up yet. Yeah. I remember taking that, it's not an achievement, what is it called, the uh, skill or whatever at some point where it reveals all locations on the map to you. That was one of my first playthroughs, though. In Skyrim? I think it is Skyrim. Maybe it's a different one. I don't know. I've played so many at this point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's on Skyrim, but if it is, I am excited. I'm also... That's Fallout. That's a Fallout. That's thing. a Fallout thing, but still Bethesda, right? Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, I like you. I'm a fan of maps, a fan of cartography, and I think a lot of our fellow listeners are as well. I'm one of those people who has, you know, at, at my house I have a, a world map where I can put the little pins in. Shout out to Mitch Hedberg for his brilliant world map joke, which I will not impersonate here. Uh, I'm also a fan of very old maps. I have prints of the uh, Piri Reese map that you and I covered in a previous episode. And I have a collection of out-of-date globes, which are also very interesting once you get to uh, the Middle East, once you get to Russia, the Balkan areas, and so on. You you are a fascinating person, Ben. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, well, we have some of those uh, some of those globes still here in the office today. Oh, uh, sure. Right? Uh, it's it's an interesting way to look at the story of humanity, and regardless of what kind of trends we see in maps and on globes over time, we do see one specific trend, which has never been violated, has never abated. It is the trend of our species to construct increasingly larger, more dense urban areas. 
As we record today's episode, humanity is officially an urban species, right? Yeah, we are. We we move towards those places, even if it's on the outskirts, in the suburban areas. As of 2016, more than 4 billion people uh, lived in these things that we would consider to be urban areas. And there are only 3.4 billion people living in what we would consider to be rural areas outside of these bigger uh, established places. Oh, and we should uh, <laughs> we should retroactively say this is the here are the facts part of the show. That's right. Uh, uh, everything that you're hearing for this part of – for this act of today's episode is indeed true. You're absolutely right, Matt. As of 2016, there were already more people living in cities than there were in rural areas. This explosive migrational trend is set to continue. By 2050 – Assuming we don't blow ourselves up or uh, encounter like a pandemic, right? Assuming that we don't find ourselves in the midst of a catastrophic water war. Uh, We will. But uh, but let's let's pretend like we'll be okay. Let's pretend. Okay. Let's be a a little bit naive about it. So everything goes okay until 2050. If everything goes more or less all right – then by 2050, two-thirds of our species will live in urban areas, technically about 68 percent. So whether you love them or whether you hate them, it seems cities are set to become one of humanity's most popular inventions. And it's interesting to think of a city as an invention. We, we don't because it's so normalized. It's so ancient. A city is now just a place. But at some point – people invented it. You know what I mean? Yeah. The the concept of having one centralized area where people can coexist generally with, you know, some kind of castle or stronghold or something to protect near the center, mm-hmm. right? Or at least somewhere strategically within that place. And then the homes and everything and the places of business all shoot up around it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And this – this is uh, this is an interesting distinction too because what is the difference between, you know, uh, an agglomeration of longhouses and a town or a town and a village or a village and of course, it's big cousin, the city. Regardless of how you want to classify a city or an urban area and there are a couple of different definitions out there, uh, we do have enough of a grasp on this phenomenon that we can describe it on a global scale. Currently, the North American continent is the most industrialized out of all the continents. As of 2018, about 82 percent of this continent's population lives in an urbanized area, 82 percent. So if you are listening uh, to this show and you happen to not be living in uh, one of those dense agglomerations, And congratulations, because you are an increasingly rare person, generally speaking, on this continent. Yeah, well, and then if, let's say, you're living in Latin America or somewhere in the Caribbean, you are not far behind, only 1% less at 82%. uh, People within those populations live in something, you know, called an urban area. And, you know, it makes sense – Interestingly enough, in in places in the Caribbean, because if you think of the amount of land mass that you actually have there, mm-hmm. um, you can imagine how people would, would just end up moving towards some of the more populated areas. That's uh, a really good point, and for especially for the types of businesses that exist in a lot of in a lot of those areas, um, you need other people to be around to sell things to. Yeah, that's a really good point, and. Uh, surprisingly, only about 74 percent of Europeans can say the same, which shocked me because the, you know, the rise of industry began earlier in Europe than it did in the U.S. It, it, mm. It's just it's surprising that only 74 percent, I guess because of the circumstances of my travels in Europe, I've always seen it as a, a, a place with little wil- wilderness. And I know that's not true, especially the further east you go. Right? Yeah. Well, and, you know, all of this is – it's not discounting, but it's not taking into account micro trends that occur, you know, within like one city. Oh, yeah. You know, some people migrating away from that city or more people 
um, then uh, then like for a period of time and then getting an injection. I'm thinking of a place like Detroit. Exactly, you know? the depopulation of Detroit. Yeah. yeah. But then then kind of a repopulation in certain areas of Detroit and then as that's going to, you know, hopefully flourish mm-hmm. in the, the coming decades. Yeah, here's hoping. Uh, I would I would love to see the rise of Detroit, you know, a, a reboot of the mm-hmm. city. Uh, but people will also uh, tell you that rumors of Detroit's demise have been greatly exaggerated, you know. Sometimes the terrible things we see on the news are just purposely made to be terrible things because that's what keeps people's attention, right? Yeah. I, I don't have much to add on that. Just agreed. <laughs> I feel like we're on the same page yeah. with that one. Uh, but uh, it may also surprise you. Going to your earlier statement, Matt, uh, it may surprise some of our listeners to know that uh, about 68 percent of Oceana's population is urbanized. And there, you know, I think I think back to what you were saying about the Caribbean archipelagos and islands. You know, it, it's a matter of scarcity of land in Oceana yeah. at least. Yeah. And – yeah, the the natural wonders of a lot of those places you want to protect as well. So you end up just kind of squishing together mm-hmm. in one major area that makes sense. And now, of course, for our finale in this in this list, uh, we have to mention the two biggest populated continents, Asia and Africa. They come in second and last place, respectively. Around half of Asia's population lives in cities. 43% of Africa's population live in urban areas. And as you know, as we like to point out, both Asia and Africa are huge, huge places filled with this incredible variety of ethnicity, of community, of culture. It's beyond apples and oranges. You know what I mean? So these these numbers only count as a cohesive thing if we're looking at the metric of just people on a continent. Yeah, it's about 17 uh, full fruit stands worth <laughs> right. per, per continent. Yeah, Matt did the math on yeah. this, the yep. fruit math. Worked it out. <laughs> so uh, obviously this is not a – static number, and it shouldn't surprise anybody to learn that those last two continents we named, Asia and Africa, are also projected to experience the largest growth in urbanization as we approach 2050. And this leads us this leads us back to you, our hypothetical but hopefully real listener who has grown up in or has moved to a rural area. We have to ask, what is the future of these increasingly abandoned rural areas? That's a story for another day, but today we're going to give you this look at cities across the world as a way of approaching another question. As we hurtle toward the extinction of privacy, the normalization of mass surveillance, and a future where opulence may well be defined as simply having a decent view from your apartment or a small backyard with a garden, it seems we will soon live in a world without strangers, a crowded cognitive space where everything is public. Everything is urban, and the maps of the future show us small concentrations of humanity, islands of concrete and steel separated by vast gulfs of what would appear to be nothing to a city dweller. Of course, there will be biodiversity, hopefully, and there will be agriculture, things of that nature. Yeah, it's going to be wastes of fire and acid water. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I, I'm I'm digging it, right? But yeah. the domes over the cities will protect us, at least temporarily. All praise the dome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, here's the thing, though. There are – all those maps that we're, like, talking about, that mm-hmm. we're thinking about in the future, they're going to have the big places, you know? You're gonna, you're, your Londons are still going to be on there. <laughs> uh, you know, your um, – your Mumbai's. Your, yo, for sure. Your Mumbai's. Uh, all, all your different places uh, that are massive known entities will be there. But there's one thing that probably won't be on your, on your maps then, even 25 years, a uh, thousand years in the future. Well, maybe a thousand years. <laughs> but in the future, there are still going to be places that will never make it to a map, places that would be considered an urban area, a city even, but won't show up. That's right. 
It was a bit of a bait and switch. We're not talking about normal cities. No. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. That's correct. As conspiratorial as it may sound, the world is full of secret cities, and attempting to enter these cities may cost you your life. Picture this. There are entire cities, like uh, metropolis-level cities, that are not villages. They're not puttering communes where everybody follows one person who had some sort of purported spiritual experience. We're talking about large collections of multiple-story buildings, huge buildings that are just somewhere in the middle of nowhere. With populations of hundreds of thousands of people in some cases. These are cities that do not officially exist in one capacity or another. And what's more, we've been building these cities for longer than you might want to think. Some cities started off as secrets only to be declassified later. Others remain closed to the majority of humanity as we record today. Let's let's start with a safe kind of um, – bucolic historic example, uh, something relatively innocuous nowadays, and it'll be close to home for a lot of our fellow listeners. That is a little place called Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Oh, yes. Uh, Oak Ridge that has connections to New York in some weird way. (laughs) Uh, We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, So about 75 years ago, the, the government in these here United States, they, they took possession of around 60,000 acres in East Tennessee. Now, officially, this occurred on September 19th, 1942. There was a, a colonel there, Leslie Groves. Yeah, this guy just kind of looked at the map, maybe took a, had some people take a trip out, and then said, yeah, this is it. This is what we want. And there wasn't anything, you know, uh, particularly extraordinary about this area, this huge swath of land. Um, Even today, you know, if you're looking back, you're reading about this, historians try and figure out exactly like what what this guy saw. But uh, they're still unsure. Yeah, they can make a couple of guesses. We know that this site in what would become Oak Ridge, Tennessee, was chosen out of a short list of several other sites across the contiguous U.S., Our guesses tend to be things like, well, we needed maybe a source of water. We needed a rural area that was removed from the hustle and bustle of a city because at the time, if you wanted something spooky done or you wanted something done in secret, you could just go to the great wilds of the United States. But you still needed – to, to have access to infrastructure and shipping if you needed it. Right, right. So you would want to be able to contact the rest of the world when necessary. Anyhow, whatever the logic was, that's, that's what General Groves chose. 60,000 acres there in East Tennessee. The area started out with a few different names in the relatively sparse official documentation. Sometimes it was called Site X, Great name for a town. Mm -hmm. Other times it was referred to as Clinton Engineering Works. That is, as far as we could find, not a reference to the uh, later Clinton political dynasty. Yeah, it is like a a company name that just stood for a location. Yeah, there was a town named Clinton nearby, Mm -hmm. near Knoxville, Tennessee, and that's what they were named at, naming this thing after. But eventually it became Oak Ridge. And while the name of this place may have undergone some iterations, its purpose was always crystal clear to those in the know. You see, Colonel Groves was overseeing what we call the Manhattan Project today. That's the New York Connect, right? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And, uh, And the town that would become Oak Ridge was built for the express purpose of helping Uncle Sam build the first atomic bomb. Oh, yeah. And we have some information here coming from the Center for Oak Ridge Oral History. Uh, Residents there uh, on the land, the people who actually lived in Oak Ridge, a lot of the families lived in the area really on just in poverty or on the brink of poverty for generations. And then all of a sudden when this land was purchased, all of them were just kicked out. They're just, bye, you have to leave. The government is moving in. Apologies, but not really. Just get out. And uh, the um, 
the feds came through, the federal government, and they condemned the land and they paid the residents like really nothing just to get them the heck out of there as quickly as possible. Right. According to the New Hope Center, one resident at the time received $900 for 40 acres of land. That's about $22.50 per acre. If, that's crazy. If we adjust for inflation, that's about $14,177 total, uh, which works out to about $354.43 per acre today. Talk about a steal. You know what I mean? Yeah. So let's keep the timeline here too. If you look into the Center for Oak Ridge Oral History, you'll see stories from people recalling that as children, the principal called everybody into the school and told them they had received a special report or special contact from the federal government. Yeah. It was September 1942. They all had to be out by December 1942. Uproot your entire life, right? And the logic here is solid and it is also ruthless. It's very important to, again, emphasize this happened in the United States not very long ago. Yeah, you, you have to imagine what the, the residents were going through, what their lives were like in order to really understand. Right. First, a lot of the rural residents would doubtlessly accept this lump sum of cash. It's a windfall. You know, it could literally be a life-changing amount of scratch – for a population where running water and indoor plumbing were often a pipe dream. <laughs> Terrible choice of words. Oh, wow. On yeah. the level of science fiction. Uh, but there's a, there's a second more disturbing fact at play too. Well, yeah. A lot of the folks living around there didn't have um, the education, let alone, you know, uh, someone with enough money to come through and mount any kind of legal protest or action against – what the federal government was doing to them. And it was very clear that no matter what, the federal government was moving in and you could either essentially take the money or just leave, right? Yeah. You're going to take the money and leave or you're just going to leave. Right. The, you know, this is, this is kind of an eminent domain thing too, right? They could say for the greater good, you have to leave this place. Yeah. We'll give you a little bit of money. But you have to leave this place. And being impoverished, they simply do not have the recourse to legal action, even if they could find someone who would represent them. This is all happening, by the way, under strict secrecy. So there's not going to be any kind of public trial. It mm -hmm. will get quashed. By 1945, just a few years later, Oak Ridge, Tennessee has 75,000 people living and working in the area. Very few of those 75,000 people knew the ultimate purpose of the secret city. Many had no idea what they were working on until the United States dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan. And the local paper said, you know, Oak Ridge uh, delivers something to the Japanese. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just mentioning there that 75,000 people lived in, lived in the area, it's not – you know, we were talking about cities. We set this whole episode up talking about cities. Oak Ridge was not like one big facility where everyone went to work every day and then everybody just left the area. They built a city there. Yeah, yeah. Schools, post office, shops, movie theater. Uh, and, and some of the people who were originally kicked out by the feds managed to get jobs later at Oak Ridge. Yeah. And they didn't know what they were doing. They, they did not know that they were processing and enriching uranium. Today, if you wish, you can visit Oak Ridge. It still processes uranium today. And while this is one of the more popular examples of a secret city, it is far from the only case of one. There are more closed cities and they remain closed today. We'll give an honorable mention to Mercury, Nevada, which, spoiler alert, I'd like to save for another episode. Well, then we won't say anything else about it. Uh, thank you for, you know, uh, glancing across this episode, Mercury, Nevada. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Radioactive ships in the night. Well, you know, we're, we're mentioning this, <laughs> yes, but we're talking about Oak Ridge and just it had a hand in the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I want to spoil too much. We talked, we made an episode on the Manhattan Project not too long ago, I believe. Hmm. Didn't we? Maybe we didn't. Maybe it's just that other secret project we're working on. Yeah. Or maybe we're both remembering forward again. I hate when oh, that happens. Oh, God. All right. Well, <laughs> um, 
Oh, it's interesting that we're hitting Oak Ridge, Tennessee in the United States, um, kind of in the heartland where the Manhattan Project was being carried out, where n- nuclear testing and the first atomic bombs were developed uh, in the United States, uh, that we're hitting that first, knowing where we're going in this episode. That's right. Where are we going? Indeed, where in the world will we find our next forbidden city? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. In what should not be a stunning plot twist to anybody who has listened to this show in the past, we are, of course, headed to Russia. Soviet Russia. Yes, yes. Like the U.S., the Soviet Union was also scrambling to invent new terrifying weapons of war. And like the U.S., they decided secret cities were the best way to carry out their work. Oh, yeah. So there were several, uh, actually numerous conspiratorial communities, communities that were off the books, forbidden, secret. Uh, In 1993, A little bit of the, you know, what would be considered the Iron Dome, the Iron Veil that keeps information from leaking out uh, was was lifted when uh, these places were officially called, they they were given a name, Closed Administrative Territorial Entities. Um, and that translates to, if you, if you take the Cyrillic, you translate it, it's Z-A-T-O or Zato. Zato. I was all, in my head for some reason, it was Zato, but Zato. I think it's just because it seems like a cool name for yeah. someone to have, is my friend Zato. It's very similar to a kitty cat in Spanish. Oh, Gato, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, I don't know, that's, <laughs> that's my, where my head goes. Oh, Zato. <laughs> but before then, before 1993... If you look at any government census, both in the Soviet Union and Russia proper and different members of the Soviet Union, you will see that these cities and the hundreds of thousands of people living and working in them simply do not exist. Closed cities were not marked on maps and there were no road marks that could lead some ignorant, uh, naive traveler to the secret settlement. It was built such that you couldn't just accidentally be there and say, oh, oh my God, <laughs> look at yeah. me. Well, especially if you were taking any kind of public transportation, like right. a train or a bus or anything like that, you would not be able to find them. You would have to get in a vehicle and then like just explore until you got to the gates where generally they say, attention, stay out. <laughs> right. Like you cannot come in here. Um, and, and it's crazy. We're, you know, we, we talked about this, this concept of the city itself was secret. So it was hidden away, um, which is kind of mind-blowing thinking about large buildings and everything right. just being secret. But then also that the human beings that occupied the cities were taken, like you said, literally taken off of the census. And families, like when you have a child and you live in one of these places, that child ostensibly doesn't exist outside of the books for that closed city. Right, exactly. So strange. And you can see the you can see the problem here. It's it sets up a slippery slope that's similar to uh, the the problem that the government of China is having with unregistered births. Right mm-hmm. when they had the one child policy, what ended up happening because a lot of parents, um, you know, of course, want to have the children that they were going to have. Uh, there's there's been this um, rise of a population of uh, of f- human beings, female people in China, who are unregistered. So they have no rights. They have no access to you know healthcare, education, medicine. It's a terrible, terrible situation. And it's all because of a couple of pieces of paper. How often does that happen with our species? You know, other animals don't do that. I'm not saying other animals are better than our brand of animal, but I don't see, even though nature's brutal, I don't see a lot of other intelligent creatures, you know, committing such horrific acts over paperwork. Yeah. Um, we could really get into this if you want to, but that's uh, that's an intense <laughs> discussion to have right there. <laughs> the, the, just the concept that a small paper that either proves that you are who you are or from a certain area mm-hmm. has li- life or death consequences throughout time. Like uh, when, we, when we did that earlier 
we definitely did a video on this, the the concept of statelessness. Yeah. People who do not have a country of origin. It's so strange. But in this case, the people in these closed cities in the USSR, as we'll come to find, uh, they did not have a huge problem with living life as ghost people, according to the bureaucracy. And actually, according to some reporting that's come out fairly recently – uh, from and and interviews from people who've lived inside these places because they got perks. Yeah, they had it pretty good. There's a documentary we'll talk about a little bit later where you can see some of these quotes uh, and there, there are people saying, we got everything that we wanted for the rest of our lives for staying here. So of course we would stay here. Don't screw this up for us, outsiders. Uh, residents of these closed cities were given private apartments – Right? And this is during the, the era of communism. So it's a big get for them. Uh, decent health care. And they had jobs for life. They had job security. And at a time when the much of the rest of the USSR was having a difficult time coming by the most basic of staples, you know what I mean? Wheat, milk, eggs, stuff like that. Residents of these closed cities were getting things that were exotic for the time, like bananas, condensed milk. They had a lot of meat products they could eat. Literally caviar. Was available. Literally caviar, yes, yes. Literally caviar. And Although you probably would not want to eat the caviar, de- which is a spoiler. Depending on the city. <laughs> yeah, yeah. city. So even today, here's the thing, even today, most residents of these closed cities consider themselves incredibly fortunate to be living in a Zato area. They're not bothered by the barbed wire fencing that surrounds them or the cognitive fencing And bureaucratic fencing, that also surrounds them. Uh, They are very mission-oriented. Instead of diving into uh, the the numerous numerous Cold War-era closed cities that we know about today and speculating on the 15 or 20 that are more or less certain to exist but remain secret, uh, let's just look at a few like high-level examples. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know – Each of these that we're going to talk about coming up are their own thing. Uh, Everything we've been talking about before this in relation to these Zato, Zato areas, um, it's similar, very similar, but each one of these is going to have its own tale. And so let's take you to a place called, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce this, Zelenogorsk. 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 Uh, Yeah, we are not Russian. Please send in, uh, dear Russian speakers uh, in the audience, please send in the correct pronunciations here. We would always prefer to be correct rather than comfortable. So Zelenogorsk is located in Russia by the Khan River, K-A-N. It was built in the 40s, 50s era as part of the Soviet drive to enrich uranium for the USSR nuclear program. Like Oak Ridge, this city had a population of thousands, and although it existed for decades, it was not on official maps until 1992. Imagine trying to get mail. Oh, by the way, when these things are in full swing, and some of them still operate this this way today, uh, these cities are not, as you said, Matt, on train and bus routes. They're only known by a postal code, a name, and a number. So what it would be like, uh, it would be like, uh, decant 47 or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With, with that with that postal code. And the other thing here is just like Oak Ridge, we're kind of comparing these two places. They This place still supplies a good amount of the uranium uh, for for Russia's production there. It um, – it's, no, it's 29 percent of the enrichment capacity that exists within Russia. So the actual places with centrifuges that are enriching mm-hmm. <laughs> uranium, that's crazy to think. Um, but it even sends uranium to other countries including the United States just because, you know, you need a little extra uranium sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Oak Ridge can't do all the production. You get by with a little help from your friends. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we're we're continuing with that trend here of a lot of these closed off cities were specifically meant to to create or at least assist in the creation of weapons of war, like massive weapons of war, new technologies that could be used to establish dominance or mm-hmm. at least hopefully. Right. Let's go to one of the most famous examples, a town called Ozersk, also known as City 40. 
Zersk is located in the Ural Mountains. It was founded in 1947. First, it was known as Chelyabinsk 40, then Chelyabinsk 65. Like other closed cities, as you said, Matt, Ozersk was built to aid the Soviet nuclear program. Unlike some other forbidden cities, Ozersk has received a great deal of media attention, notably in a documentary called City 40, which we highly recommend. Yeah, seriously, uh, check it out if you possibly can or at least read up Mm -hmm. on the contents of it because there are so many fascinating stories and humans involved. And it is a tragic story. Yeah. So the citizens of this place, of City 40, have a fairly unique dilemma. And I quite like the way The Guardian put it in an article on the, on the closed city. It's this. Their water is contaminated, their mushrooms and berries are poisoned, and their children may be sick. Ozersk and the surrounding region is one of the most contaminated places on the planet, referred to by some as the graveyard of Earth. Yet... Most of City 40's residents do not want to leave. They take pride in their community. They still have that attitude of um, feeling that they have received immense privilege. Yes, and they and they have in a lot of ways. And their families have benefited from that privilege. But their families have also, in most cases, a family member or two or more have died because – they have lived in that place. Right. Yeah, they were heavily contaminated by industrial pollution from the nearby Mayak plutonium plant from the, what, the late 1940s on? This was an ongoing thing. This plant was one of the largest producers of weapons-grade plutonium for the Soviet Union during a lot of the Cold War, particularly during the atomic bomb program. And... Uh, it was built with, once again, the greater good in mind. Got to break a few eggs. We want to get some atomic omelets, said the Soviet government. You know what I mean? What's, yeah. What's a couple people in the great balance of life? You know what I mean? Hakuna Matata, et cetera, they said. And then they built this with no regard for safety. Well, yeah, that's that's the crazy thing. It's – um. There have been several. One major disaster that occurred at one of the major plants there that ended up irradiating, I think it was like 200,000 people or something like that. Or it was a crazy number of people in villages that just lived, you know, upstream or away from the actual plant because these, they were dumping radioactive waste directly into the water. Into that, into that river that we keep talking about there. And we're dumping solid waste, liquid uh, waste, <laughs> gaseous matter, all radioactive. And they were doing this for more – for not more than, but for around a decade, from 1945 to 57. Yeah. And here's, here's the part that was mind-blowing for me as I was learning about it. You know, when you, in, when you imagine a, um, a nuclear accident or a disaster, what comes to mind? Chernobyl, right? Three That's, Mile Island. Chernobyl is yeah, first, though. Yeah. Chernobyl always is at the top of the list. And over all this time, when the waste was being dumped, the sum of contamination of radioactive contamination is has been estimated to be two to three times the release from the Chernobyl accident explosions. Now, here's the deal: Chernobyl kind of occurred, exploded. Your your radioactive waste mm. is, you know, gone into the air and is spread out across a wide area. But for this, they're literally pumping out the radioactive waste continually for a decade. In 1957, this reaches a head. The Mayak plant is the site of an enormous disaster. An underground tank of highly irradiated liquid nuclear waste explodes And it contaminates thousands of square kilometers of territory. Nowadays, it's known as the Eastern Ural Radioactive Trace or the YURT, E-U-R-T. The problem is that this disaster is quietly, efficiently, and ruthlessly covered up. And very, very few people inside or outside of the USSR were aware of what actually happened until at least 1980. And this has also been called the Kishtam disaster. 
specifically, you know, this is September 29th. And I really appreciate what you're pointing out here, Matt, because we're all familiar with Chernobyl, especially in the world of fiction in the in the recent day and age, because there was a masterful miniseries done uh, that I think aired on HBO, but it didn't really address this. And can you imagine living here? And you've been told that you are the sword and shield of uh, to save the world, right? That's why you and your family are working in this this great project to make this new weapon of war. You're not doing it to sow chaos. You're doing it to um, guarantee peace. Well, and, and also be triumphant over those who want to do harm. Right, exactly. Because every war is a war of defense. Da 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 da. But. Uh, I didn't mean to sound so dismissive. I just don't believe it when people say that anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh, but the the kicker is imagine being that person. So you're ideologically on board probably and you learn weeks after the fact, at the very least, weeks after the fact that your you and your children – have been irradiated and you can't find anything about it even in the news, even in the secret city newspaper that's supposed to give you – you're one of the inner yeah. circle. You know, what yeah. What happened? Why are you only seeing these vague reports and why don't they jibe with the firsthand sightings you're hearing of, of people with skin falling off their faces, their body parts being exposed, their hair falling out along with their toenails and so on. Yeah. Let, let me quickly paint a scenario just for all of us sitting here and listening. Let's imagine that we're one of the um, uh, minority few who live out somewhere in a rural area. And let's say we live in Russia. It's 1957 and our small family owns some farmland and lots and lots of livestock or at least enough livestock to, you know, to survive as well as a lot of crops and we're just hanging out. We're doing all the strenuous work we have to do every day to maintain what we have, which is still very little. And then all of a sudden, you know, we don't notice anything really. We heard maybe about a, a big bang, a large bang that occurred somewhere, you know, southwest of here a couple of days ago. But that's all we've really heard about. Uh, there were some weird clouds that came over, like appeared to be smoke or something. We haven't thought about any of that stuff since that day. Well, a big truck rolls through with a lot of our, you know, countrymen, our, our military people. They're, they're just coming through and they happen to stop by our farm. And they let us know that today we have to slaughter all of our cattle. Mm -hmm. We have to uproot and then bury all of our crops. Then we have to plow all that over and then we have to get the heck out and, because they're going to purchase our farm for the, almost nothing. They're also wearing containment suits. Yeah. Uh, then they did not bring spares. Yeah. Just letting us know. And here's the other thing. Um, let's say that occurs and then years later, after you know that went down, you know what's occurred. Nobody has put any record of this down. Nobody is talking about all the other farms like that were just in this giant line that I can look at a map and see, like I know people lived in this line and they all had to sell their houses, their, uh, their farms, but nobody's talking about it. There's a beauty, the dark beauty to the, the brutal logic there. It's so the same way that rural people in the U S could not fight back against their yes. land being taken. Uh, people who do not officially exist have no legal recourse because they are ghosts. It just now uh, reached a point where their physical condition matched the condition of the paperwork, which wow. is in, just insidious. I mean, it is, it is unclean to do that to people, but I see the logic of it. And there are plenty, plenty more. Uh, we could probably do an episode per city on closed cities in Russia, but we don't want to just stay in the Cold War in the U.S. and Russia, or the USSR, excuse me. Let's take a quick look at other cities, some of which might surprise you. In the 
mainland of China, there is a place called the Nuclear Town. It is in the Gobi Desert in the western part of Gansu Province. Officially, it's called the Number 404 Factory of China National Nuclear Corporation. I love that it's called 404, right? Pretty, it's yeah. such a bad internet joke. It's unknown. I hope someone did it on purpose. It's not found. Yeah. Gosh. So it was built back in 1958, so probably not a good joke, unless the people who did 404 and the internet were making a, a, a sideways reference to this fact. Probably not. Probably not. The world's not that convenient nor well written. I say we I say we go with it until someone tells us it's for something else. And then let's accuse them of covering it up. That's right. Well, that's a, that sounds like a plan, <laughs> Matt. So this is the biggest nuclear industry base in the country that we know of. It's the country's first military nuclear reactor. 80% of China's nuclear bomb core components are built there. For 20 years, it was completely closed to outsiders. And that's not the only case in China. There are a couple of other more remote places where you have to apply for what's called an alien travel document mm -hmm. in advance to visit. And you have to report to the police as soon as – like your accommodations as soon as you stay somewhere. And if you don't follow everything to the letter, you get the boot. They will immediately take you out of the country. Yeah, just get the heck out. Man, it – We've got this running thing. We're going to come back to it in the conclusion. But just if you're going to create fissile material to be weaponized mm -hmm. for any reason or just let's say it's just to run a power plant. It's a, a, lot, a lot of people that are doing that are making these weird, hidden, creepy cities. Yeah. It, it turns out to maybe be the best way to go about this, right? Yeah. Because if you have – because you can control more variables if you, if you have the entire city purpose built. Like we have um, – you know, we have military armament manufacturers that are based in or near large urban areas, but – they the, no matter how how well they secure their grounds they cannot control the millions of people who live like you know across the river or get through the woods i don't know whatever sure. you want to say yep so this is this is a very common trend and these secret cities are still around today and in some cases yes the people who live in them do not technically exist on paper let, we want to do one more example, uh, something that is completely different. It's a closed city, a closed part of a city that does not exist for nuclear research and does not exist for some kind of um, human rights abuse or concentration camp thing, right? So let's travel to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. You've heard it before. This is not a – the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, KSA, should not be a new thing to any of our listeners. It is a unique country in the world of geopolitics for a number of reasons and its most famous closed city is no different. Unlike the majority of secret cities we've mentioned today, Mecca is not closed due to top secret military or industrial research. Instead, it's a partially closed city because every year – Millions and millions and millions of people visit, and you can too, as long as you, like them, are a practitioner of Islam, because only Muslims are allowed in Mecca. It is the holiest, most important city in the religion. It is off limits under any circumstances to any non-Muslims. Don't even try. Yeah. If, if you do attempt and you don't meet all of those requirements, you will immediately be deported and that will be it. Thank you for trying to come in, but uh, we don't appreciate you. Why? No, I'm just kidding. It's not, it's not that harsh, but you would definitely get deported immediately. Well, you know, the penalty in practice may be much harsher than deportation. A lot of it depends on what kind of person you are, your country of origin, right? Yes. Uh, and it could – go to up to and including assault, torture, murder. You just – you don't know. And as a personal message to anybody else who enjoys traveling to the edges of the maps, to the places where <laughs> normal people don't take vacation, 
I, I definitely want to warn every non-Muslim person against trying to sneak into Mecca. It's not like taking a quick illicit trip across the poorest Midwestern or Alaskan border between Canada and the U.S. Your chances of being caught are extremely high. If you feel that you must go to Mecca, that you genuinely must go there, the most rational choice is to convert to Islam beforehand. Actually do it. Attempting to fake a conversion will also, by the way, in all likelihood, fail. Now, I know that there are uh, photographs of plenty of someone who said, like, oh, I snuck into Mecca or whatever. Uh, there was a recent story about a guy who uh, I think acquired his Israeli citizenship in 2014, uh, and he he visited. Uh, and he said that it was on the up and up, but I have a tough time believing him. Uh, and, and also, you know, inherently, it's the most important city in this religion that millions of people follow. And I, I don't know, man. This is a personal take. I, I kind of I want your opinion too, Matt. Should people be able to do that? I, I feel like personally it would be disrespectful for me to say, well, I don't care about your core belief system. I need some selfies. You know what I mean? That that just feels I don't know. Yeah, no. It, yeah, it, it certainly doesn't feel like a good idea. Um, I'm trying to find an like something that would be the equivalent, but I don't know if there's anything in the world that's as close to that. There are, I mean, it's I'm a, trying to imagine the wailing wall or, uh-huh. but that's not like it's uh, restricted. Well, in, in some religions way. in the West, like the uh, church of latter day saints, don't they not allow some people into the temple? Like people are not. Yeah, I mean, yeah, or faith. Scientology, or any, you know, okay, a lot yeah, of these, yeah. a lot of these belief systems would have closed off areas, closed off things, right? But that's closed like off micro understandings. Yeah. But a large place um, like Mecca, it's it's interesting. Um, hmm. I'm trying to imagine for some. Well, no, it's not the same. What if to, someone started a religion and it was based in Detroit? Yeah, and they said you can't go to Detroit unless you follow this religion. And I'd be saying, well, Detroit's pretty big. Detroit is really yeah. <laughs> that was sure? a very bad example <laughs> no, on no, my no, part. No, 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 no. that that callback just we're working live. You know, not all of these are going to be a hundred percent solid gold hits. <laughs> no. no, but but it is. I think the core of what you're saying in that it's a bad idea to undermine this this rule that's in place. You know, for a reason for a very popular belief system. That's probably a bad idea. But then, you know, I'm, I always imagine the spycraft that occurs in a place like Mecca or in a place like Jerusalem or uh, the Vatican. You know, there's probably fascinating deep spycraft occurring in all of those places from varying countries for, with varying interests, you know. Um, mm. And that's just me assuming. But that's what I'm imagining when you're talking about something as closed off as Mecca is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, we have we have a lot of listeners um, who, are, who are very close to their faith. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. ardent practitioners thereof. Just, just to me, and again, this is just my opinion, I do – I feel like it's completely OK to say, hey, out of respect – for our belief system, just sorry, this one part of the world doesn't have to be yours. I, I, I think that's perfectly okay. Like Uluru or Ayers Rock, as it's sometimes called in Australia, the native population said this is very important to us. Please just st- stop having your self-aggrandizing tourist adventures yeah. here. The only problem is the moment you say you can't go here, I mean, it's it's that old thing with like, don't touch that button. Don't think of pink elephants. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, psychologically, that, that occurs in many of us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm no different, obviously. <laughs> what would be better is if you just kept it off the map. Nobody knew about it. You just had a postal code. Uh-huh. If, you, if you were aware of, you know, Mecca. But that's it. 
I guess, yeah, yeah. It, it, there's the other part too. I, I, I would go on record saying that it's completely different if someone says, okay, we have founded – our new city or our new religion or belief system and everybody who was living here before either convert or GTFO, I think that's very different. Yes. You know yes. what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I, I'm making I'm not trying to make light of oh, that totally. situation. It's yeah. just uh anyway. I'm trying to make a callback that I think didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, uh, instead of calling back, maybe let's call forward because it seems the story continues. For all of these places we just mentioned, in the case of Russia, currently it's estimated there are about 44 closed cities in existence. About uh, uh, 1.5 million people live in these total. And there are also, according to rumors, around 15 other closed cities that exist without their whereabouts or their names being disclosed by the government. If you would like to visit a closed city, I'm very excited about giving this a shot one day, uh, you are welcome to give it the old college try. Getting into these places is, if you look at the uh, spectrum of difficult entries and exits, it's easier than entering North Sentinel Island. Uh, But it's still tougher than getting into a place like the DPRK, North Korea. Non-residents who want to visit closed cities have to get a special pass from the Russian security service, the the secret police, essentially. So if you, Matt, and uh, you, Paul, and and I, and you listening, if we all – if we all got together and we requested these passes, depending on the city and – you know, hinging on the fact that we are not Russian nationals, we would almost certainly be rejected. Mm-hmm. And that's not that's not all. Applying for one of these things, even if you are a Russian national and you are related to someone who lives in a closed city, applying for one of these things, whether or not you were accepted, puts you on a list with Russian intelligence for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know what else gets you on that list? What's that? Listening to an episode with the metadata Z-A-T-O and Russia Secret Cities. (laughs) Oh, no. It is in the metadata. (laughs) I'm pretty sure. I had a depressing conversation with um, some of my old old colleagues about – which countries you can get into and out of. Like the stands are pretty much no goes for me. And uh, and my friends who were working in the PRC were saying, well, you know, it's, it's okay, I guess, uh, as long as your podcast isn't in Mandarin. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and, it, you know, it makes you think, like what happened with those um, with those folks for Radio Free America? Did you hear about this? The, yeah, I did. The, we, did we talk about this in there? I don't know if we talked about it on the air. I it think I've had been a few conversations, out. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so some Uyghur journalists that were working with Radio Free America, which is a U.S.-supported propaganda network, but it doesn't mean it's 100 percent wrong all the time. Uh, their families have been threatened. And there's uh, an intense debate going on now about the situation in Western China, which we should report on more soon. We – we got there a little bit before it broke international news. Mm. Anyhow, if you want to visit this place and if it is worth being on a list with Russian intelligence for the rest of your life, not necessarily a bad thing, I guess, then yeah, you're more than welcome to apply. But keep in mind, passes are only given to those who have relatives in closed cities or people who are traveling to closed cities on a business trip. So for like, hey, maybe we use different names, you know, like, hey, I'm Johnny America. I'm, and I'm uh, Timmy Big Bucks. <laughs> And we're here for oil or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah. The new, new kind of uh, uh, roller blade. <laughs> then Jeez. maybe we can get in. But even then, access isn't guaranteed. You can try to get a permanent pass, but it's more challenging. You know, there are two ways to get them, basically. You have to be, have been born there. Yeah. Or you have to work in one of the enterprises they need. So be a nuclear scientist or be born there. Yeah. And get irradiated while you hang out in City 40, just like everybody else. So this is something – I know we're wrapping up here, but really quickly, something that struck me. We're – we talked about that disaster that officially didn't occur Mm -hmm. within City 40. At least for a long time, it was not disclosed that that actually happened and that amount of radiation was released into the wild. 
it makes me think about Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and the place where the United States, you know, started its its nuclear industry. Really, um, it makes me wonder if anything has occurred within within that area that was never reported mm-hmm. and was just covered up, and people and livestock and crops were dosed beyond you know any sane amount Mm -hmm. and we just never found out about it because if we were to find out about it, there would be such an uproar. Um, I I just, it makes me wonder. Yeah. Agreed. Now there's a side of me that says if something like that did occur at Oak Ridge, then there's no way they could completely cover that up. Some paper somewhere, somebody would know, somebody would talk. Hmm. But the other part of me thinks it was at a time of war And just like the people of City 40, we were told and we believed, the people who lived there at the time, that we were fighting the good fight. This is all in the name of the United States victory. This is all in the name of securing our family's futures and we'll go along with it. And then they all died because they got dosed by radiation. Yeah, they died died to a terminal condition known as the greater good. But uh, that's all – fabricated from my mind. I'm just wondering. It's possible. What untold that's, things have occurred. Yeah, that's the disturbing thing. It's possible. You know what I mean? Like the Vela incident where, where the uh, nuclear bomb was tested, mm-hmm. right? Uh, these things happen. They may not happen in your backyard, but that doesn't make them any less terrifying. And now it gets to our, our final question. How long will these closed cities stay closed? Some are Cold War relics, but a surprising amount of them are still manufacturing fissile material, right? They're mm-hmm. enriching uranium. They're making weapons-grade plutonium. Uh, business is booming. Business is good. Those cities may well stay closed. And what about the ones that we don't know, the ones that are still off of the maps? It's strange. It's strange to think about. And here we hand it to you, folks. Are there any closed or restricted areas in your neck of the woods? If so, what are they? What do you know about them? Give us the scoop if you can. Do you live in a closed city? If you do, congratulations on your VPN, bro. Nice one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let us let us know uh, to the extent that you're able uh, what what your experiences or your loved one's experiences living in this place. Uh, we have so many ways for you to get in touch with us. Yes, find us on Twitter or Facebook where we are Conspiracy Stuff. We are at Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram. Ben, what is your personal Instagram? Uh, I do have one. Uh, you can uh, see me do various things at Ben Bolin on Instagram. And I'm Matt Frederick underscore iHeart. Good luck to you. You might find it. I've only got like four or five posts on there. Who cares? You're not going to like it. Don't look at it, but it's there. Oh, that's some of the psychology you were talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah. So is your Instagram a closed city? It is. Oh, but you, oh. you I'm, but I'm telling you the postal code. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm telling you exactly where it is. Anyway, uh, that's, that exists. If you don't like any of that stuff, you can give us a call. We are 1-833-STDWYTK. Leave a message. You might get on the air. We're going to hear what you say. The phone doesn't ring, so we just hear your message. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's fascinating for us. We like uh, hearing from you that way. If you don't want to do any of that stuff, the best way to contact us is to send a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.